morning, everybody. My name is Connor Flanagan. And I'm the assistant director here at the Southampton History Museum. Uh, this morning, uh, we are here to celebrate Earth Day, and I'm joined by a few of my friends here. Uh, we have Shanae Bullock, owner and operator of Mosquito Consulting, an indigenous education consulting firm. Um, Eric Wurzberg, uh, the owner and operator of East End Explorer, and Mark Matthews, the executive director of the North Sea Maritime Center. Um, what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about an area that means a lot to all of us here and everybody here in Southampton, known as Conscience Point. Um, we celebrate this piece of land every year by doing our really great Indigenous Perspective Canoe Tours every summer. Um, if you haven't been to any of those before, we just made the tickets available for the first program on our website, southamptonhistory.org, which you can sign up for today. Um, and today's talk will be a bit to learn about some of the history, some of the ecology of the area, why it's important, and give you a taste of what hopefully is to come this summer. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to turn everything over to Shanae for the first part of today's talk. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Akwe. Um, happy Earth Day to everyone. It's actually a beautiful day. I'm trying to share my screen here and we'll get started in um, my presentation. So my name is Shanae Bullock, just as Connor mentioned. I am the founder and owner and CEO of Moxquitu Consulting. I am a Shinnecock um, tribal member um, located in Southampton, Long Island, New York. Um, but I wanted to like, I, I always like to start out by giving land acknowledgement in anything that I do um, in anywhere we are, even if we're virtual, right? Um, that's something that during the pandemic, I've been seeing a lot more in these presentations and it's pretty cool. So I encourage all of you to visit www.native-land.ca. And it's an awesome database where you can literally type in anywhere in the world that you're at and it will geolocate the traditional homelands of that place. So I screenshotted this because I think we all know where we're at. We're on Shinnecock territory um, and which we're essentially kind of located right here. This, this right here, if you can see, is where the Shinnecock uh, quote unquote reservation is. But all of this essentially is Shinnecock territory. So as we talk about um, Conscious Point, you're able to see that this is Shinnecock territory. Um, and so this is a great tool to be able to use for that. Um, this is currently <laughs> what we have left um, in our jurisdiction, which is the Shinnecock Reservation. Um, many of you may or may not be familiar with that, um, but I wanted to be able to kind of show you the difference between what we once had and what we've kind of, kind of boiled down to. But the unique thing about our people is that we haven't left like most um, communities uh, throughout the country, unfortunately, they were forcefully removed. Uh, we actually stayed um, and we've been able to stay there. Um, so with this being Earth Day, I had to just put this uh, quote here, um, which is let's collectively come together to raise our consciousness um, to save the earth. And that's what we're doing here at Moxquito Consulting. Um, to work with our partners to be able to do that. And even though we're focused on the water, the water is a vast part of the earth as well. Um, gave you a little bit of information about me. Um, I'm the managing director of our, our um, enterprise, uh, the Shinnecock uh, Cannabis Enterprise called Little Beach Harvest. And I've also wrote a book called 50 Plant Medicines, Indigenous Oral History and Perspective. Um, a little bit about Moxquito Consulting. Um, we don't just do paddle tours, um, but we do a lot of ecological tourism, cultural tourism, genealogical consulting, um, cultural presentations like this, and so much more. But our focus is really to help um, contribute to the social and environmental aspects, um, advancements with our partners and for our clients. Um, so that we can all kind of, you know, work together to create environmental and social change. Um, so jumping into the big topic, um, this is a beautiful uh, photo of myself at the front of this long, huge, historically made machine. In our language, machine means canoe. 
Um, and this canoe is the largest of its kind. It hadn't been made in over 400 years. Um, it was tulip poplar. Um, and this was something that was made at the Mashantucket Pequot Museum. Um, and we paddled in this canoe in the Mystic River, um, right at the Mystic Seaport in um, Connecticut to greet the Hukalea. And the Hukalea Voyaging Society, um, if you were actually, if you can see at the bottom of my screen here, it says Polynesian Voyaging Society. If you were to find that on Instagram, they're actually sailing the world again. So what they did for two years is they sailed the world um, from the high seas, the Polynesian high seas, um, to travel to indigenous coastal communities um, so that we can address what's happening with the rising sea levels. Um, and so what we did, which is a part of our customs and traditions, just like we did at Conscious Point um, in 1640, we greeted them in our machines um, before they came to land. So <clears throat> our history is so interconnected through our waterways and landscapes. Um, and today more and more people are so interested in not only learning about our history, but our continued existence. So I think this is a great photo because you're able to see like the modern day houses. You're obviously able to see how we're still utilizing our cultural teachings to um, be sustainable in the environment within a carbon neutral vessel such as a machine. Um, and I wanted to show some of the photos of our tours that we've been giving with the South Canton History um, Museum at Conscious Point. Um, and it's, it's amazing because being able to share this history with um, local people and not only just local people, we've had people to come all the way from Connecticut, come all the way from New York City, New Jersey, um, Boston. Um, a lot of different people have traveled for this tour. Um, so we do encourage all of you to be able to come and check it out. Um, you can, can you see the top of my screen? Okay. So on the tour, I typically like to talk about things going all the way from the past to the present and the future. So when we think about the past, this photo here, this painting was actually um, created by um, David Martin, who is a well-renowned uh, Shinnecock artist. And this is his image of what it looked like, um, even at Conscious Point, of what it looked like where we, where we lived. As you can see the shellfish, you know, in the basket, you can see the fishermen, um, you know, so I, I like to talk about that as we're on the water. I like to help people understand what this once looked like. Um, there is a beautiful place at Conscious Point that hasn't been touched and it does have that beautiful, um, that wildlife, um, the biodiversity is preserved there. Um, but when we think about our people, the Shinnecock people, we were semi-nomadic you know, we, we lived with the seasons, we harvested and foraged and ate with the seasons. Again, we traveled the world by carbon neutral vessels, uh, which we get to do on the, on the tour in our kayaks and canoes and paddle boards. Um, and we had hunting and shellfishing um, traditions. And so I get into a little bit of this uh, in depth, but I also talk about the historical ties that, um, uh, my specific ancestors, like Wyandance, Dance, Mondush, Noah Donna, you know, the, the famous, if you will, Shinnecock and Montauk people had to that place um, as well. I jumped deep into that. And then we move into, well, what kind of happened, right? Um, we had forced assimilation. Um, we, there were so many different types of things and I weave a lot of these different topics from the Pequot massacre to the King Philip's war to the indentured servitude to paper genocide, which this photo here, um, it doesn't do any justice because I've kind of, uh, circled it, but in script here, it says the last of the Shinnecock Indians. And this photo was taken in like the 1800s. And so this is a form of paper genocide, which is why a lot of times it is so important for us to be able to give these kinds of tours and presentations because I myself am a real life descendant of these people 
And if these were the last of the Shinnecocks, then I wouldn't be able, I wouldn't be in existence. But surprisingly, there's a lot of people that still think that we don't exist. So being able to give these um, presentations helps with that, um, but also doing that in the eco, um, in, in the ecotourism, such as our kayak tours, um, definitely helps as well, <laughs> because we're able to kind of um, provide so many answers to so many different questions about the land. Um, but there's so many things that have happened and that we all have to come together to, to kind of recognize and specifically around Earth Day, it allows us to be able to talk about this, um, is that the foreign animals and the foreign plants, I get into talking about the, the, um, the biodiversity um, and, and how we're losing a lot of that, but our indigenous plants were actually aiding to the health of the environment. And because of the invasive plants that have been brought over such as Phragmites, you're not able to see so, so much of the cattail reeds and the bulrush. Um, so we talk about that and it's, and it's really awesome while we're out there to be able to kind of see these different kinds of things as well. Um, but we talk about the resiliency as well um, in our tribal communities, in our future. Here is a photo of um, my nieces and nephews um, at our Shinnecock powwow. Um, and here's another photo of myself and my relatives um, protesting the desecration, the continued desecration of our Shinnecock Hills, which are our burial grounds. Um, so I answer a lot of those questions because we have a lot of people on the tours that um, might be residents of this area and see a lot of different things in the newspapers and have questions of, and concerns and want to figure out how they can support and how they can help um, you know, with the efforts um, that we have and the different causes that we have. So, but it's very important to note that the environmental, the indigenous rights, indigenous issues are not just um, for us indigenous people, but they connect to the environment. And if they connect to the environment, then that becomes a, humani a humanitarian um, issue. Um, and that's something that we talk about. Um, and so having our, our youth learn all of these things from the history of the land, um, and to knowing what their responsibility is on the land, they have a better understanding as to why we're standing up fighting for those reasons as well. So we'll get into talking a little bit about that. Um, again, you can actually visit www.moxitoconsulting.com um, and check out you know, the Earth Day sale that's going on um, for the ebook that we have here. And you can also follow me on Instagram at Natui Usqua. Okay, this is Mark Matthews. I'm the president of the North Sea Maritime Center and I'm glad to be part of this group, this very good group today. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about um, uh, the area, the Conscious Point area and about the North Sea Maritime Center. So here it, is, here it goes. North Sea, never heard of it. I thought you lived in Southampton. For many years, that was the reply when I enthusiastically proclaimed the location of my well-loved home. Well, I want you to know that North Sea is a sweet area of the East End South Fork with not only rural quietness amid saltwater surroundings, but it also has a very historic background. When the colonists from Lynn Mass arrived here, after their first move to Manhasset of Long Island, which didn't succeed. They were so thankful to arrive that when touching dry land, one woman exclaimed, for conscience sake, we're on dry land, thus christening the small point of land their boat had reached. Sailing around the North Fork into Little Peconic Bay, the enterprising group came through a small inlet, finally reaching the protected small piece of water now known as North Sea Harbor. From this harbor, the colonists ventured south to the area of Old Town where they founded the small village of Southampton. However, the area of North Sea and its enclosed safe harbor remained the focus of the water-based activity for the remainder of the 1600s. A small community grew up there adjacent to a local settlement of the tribe of Shinnecock Indians. There were several farmhouses, 
two taverns, a warehouse, a brick kiln, and a customs house, all based in this northern spot, which was called Feversham. During these decades of the 1600s and into the early 1700s, this port of Feversham was the third busiest port in this New World area, only exceeded by Boston and Philadelphia. This intermediary destination was part of the Atlantic coastal trade and did not diminish in popularity until the development of nearby community of Sag Harbor. Then an increasing need for this deep water harbor port developed, Sag Harbor gained prominence, especially for the whaling trade. Thus, Feversham declined in importance in population and in renown. It became the small hamlet of North Sea and became the province of recreational watercraft, small farms and family businesses. Its decline in importance actually encouraged its natural beauties and peaceful atmosphere and today is known as a quiet retreat from the hectic pace of the summer South work activities. For a brief moment in time, it, was, it joined the popularity of the VIP people in the know for this boathouse on these lovely harbor waters was sold and hosted a restaurant and many iterations of nightclubs until finally the noise and disturbance were brought to a halt when the town of Southampton purchased the property with CPF monies. Now, in quiet obscurity, the boathouse sat there as the Peconic Marina was built and a different collection of boats grew along the creek in the summer, fulfilling the area's return to watercraft, sailing, and fishing. The launching area of Southampton Town's trustees was a favorite place for many neighbors and visitors to launch their small boats throughout the sailing months. The Conscious Point area itself, under the ownership and care of the Southampton History Museum, maintained the long ago trail to the 20 ton rock that marked the very place commemorating the landing of the colonists so many years ago. Then the Conscious Point Shellfish Hatchery joined the activities to the north of the marina area. A thriving enterprise, the volunteer group raises oysters, seeds them in local waters, and sells some of the produce to local restaurants in a very productive use of this natural resource. About 10 years ago, people again became interested in the large structure standing by the harbor known as the boathouse. After its purchase, it sat there unused, almost forgotten, until a group of local restaurants, uh, residents, plus relatives of the original owners began the process of rescue. Making it a historic landmark opened the door for its new life. The town of Southampton applied for a grant from the New York State Hurricane Sandy grants and the boathouse frequently flooded by storms was elevated to escape the floodwaters of future hurricanes and nor'easters. Then the people from this local group formed the North Sea Maritime Center, a 501c3 nonprofit corporation and started the process of becoming a steward or caretaker of this 1930s building. It needed work, it needed money, it needed a dream, and a dream was found. I quote from the vision. The vision for the North Sea Maritime Center at the historic Tupper Boathouse is to establish a maritime center celebrating the importance, past and future, of North Sea Harbor by offering the following programs and facilities. A wooden boat building facility, a maritime museum celebrating the importance past and future of the North Sea Harbor, Southampton's first port. Classes to teach local maritime history, water navigation, sailing, boat safety, basic boat maintenance, and other marine related programs and activities. And a facility where local educational institutions can have field experience and host, host marine related programs, events, and workshops. Board members were recruited for the organization. Initial fundraising began, a stewardship agreement to enable the board to pursue their goals responsibly and effectively was drawn up and contacts started 
to be made for both local and summer residents to join in the effort to bring back into a broad perspective all of the many activities that North Sea Harbor encompasses. Many groups are interested in this area and we hope to bring the combined resources of the Southampton History Museum, the Southampton Town Trustees, the Town of Southampton, the Conscious Point Shellfish Hatchery and the North Sea Maritime Center into creating a place that will be appealing for many people to visit with a wide ranging area of activities and interests. What a spot this North Sea Harbor is. As I look around, I realize how much is, it is almost the same as it was years ago. On the Western side of the Harbor, the outer lands of Cowneck Farm, now owned by Lewis Bacon and the Wild National Wildlife Refuge, formerly Stanley Howard's property, curve gently, undisturbed wetlands and fields. There are a few residences, the whole Conscious Point area and the Eastern Inlet called Fish Cove that at one point hosted Linda's Farm, a spiritual and intellectual retreat partially funded by Lawrence Rockefeller. I am truly thankful that this beautiful place exists. Our quiet home North Sea our serenely lovely harbor, the Tidal Creek and its docks will find the North Sea Maritime Center a helpful, interesting and inspiring neighbor. And Earth Day is a grand day to think of the marvelous uses made of this harbor and its surrounding land. It's a true reminder of the value of preserving our Earth and its waters. So um, we've got a good beginning here. We're moving along well. The town is a good partner in this, this effort. And uh, we look forward to bringing our mission to life. And um, I'll be glad to answer any questions later on. Well, hello, happy Earth Day to everybody. That was a great presentation, Mark and Shanae. Um, my name is Eric Warsberg. I am the owner of East End Explorer and uh, I too live in North Sea and find it to be a magical, place. Um, we do uh, kayak tours and paddle tours. Uh, we go all over the East End, but we're mainly in North Sea Harbor uh, because of the opportunities that, that are there. Um, it is a beautiful place with a strong community. There's always a friendly face on the water and everybody is uh, around the area is always, you know, helping out with the harbor. And I see Mark's friendly face quite often there as well. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. So what do, does East End Explorer do? Um, well, we do a multitude of things and our main goal is uh, basically environmental education and, and sharing this love and passion that I have with everybody else. Um, I'm a father of two, so uh, I like getting children involved. We own Explorer Camp, uh, we're a marine science-based uh, immersive nature camp um, for kids six to 13. Um, we also do private guided paddle tours, uh, and along with those tours, uh, in-depth immersive nature experiences. Uh, we take people clamming and crabbing. Uh, we teach a little bit about aquaculture at Conscience Point Oyster Farm. Uh, we sane uh, for juvenile fish, um, and we've been known to take people on the occasional fishing trip as well. Um, we also offer self-guided tours for, for those uh, that just wanna go at their own pace. We have mapped routes, and uh, we let people just venture off. Now we do also do Sabonic Creek, Scallop Pond, Clam Island and other areas. But again, it, for anybody the first time, I always recommend North Sea Harbor. It is our, our flagship uh, tour and it's just an amazing area. Um, we're also involved in these collaborative group paddles um, such as the Indigenous Perspectives Tour with Shanae and, and the History Museum. Um, we do tours with SOFO, the South Fork Natural History Museum. Um, we work with uh, the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at Stony Brook, uh, as well as others. Um, and then we also do large corporate events and, and group paddles. Um, we float a lot of people. So, uh, so our mission of East End Explorer is, uh, yeah, we aim to provide this unforgettable immersive experience, uh, one of peace, understanding, and love for our natural world. Um, our goal is to educate through tactile learning, which is hands-on, either digging the clams or watching deer frolic across the meadow, pulling stain nets or catching crabs in the marsh. 
Um, it's that takeaway feeling, uh, the feeling you leave with, which is that seed to inspire the sense of stewardship. Uh, we're all part of the system. Uh, and it just sometimes takes that special experience to realize that. And that experience is our, our, our goal that you, you take away with you. So North Sea Harbor in particular, we're part of the larger Peconic estuary system, uh, which is a very significant estuary on the East Coast and in the world. Um, and just to go a little bit about the ecology of that, so basically an estuary is where salt and fresh water mix. Um, and estuaries are very productive ecosystems. They're used by fish, shellfish, birds, all kinds of animals, for feeding, nesting, breeding, uh, nursery areas, a lot of juvenile fish. Uh, come and then go back out into the ocean. And then there's uh, tons of species that actually just live their whole lives in the estuaries. Um, within North Sea Harbor and the estuary, we have different smaller ecosystems, the salt marshes, uh, tidal flats, grass beds, and deep water zones, all of which we like to explore on our tours. And um, even if I'm not on tour, I'll take my family to do this stuff. This is the eight-year-old boy and me comes out, uh, even though I'm far past eight at this point. Um, so the North Sea Harbor is fed from ocean tides through the bays, as well as runoff from various springs and creeks, such as Alawife Creek, Fish Cove, Davis Creek, um, and underground springs as well. So here's some of the species you may encounter uh, in North Sea Harbor. We have uh, North Atlantic puffer fish, blue crabs, uh, oyster farmers. Uh, they are doing great work, and we're going to talk about that here shortly. That's Chris out there talking to some uh, guests of mine. Uh, we have whelk. At the bottom right, we have a stout razor clam. Those are interesting. You, when you walk in the mud, you'll see a little hole, and they'll squirt a little water up. When you dig for them, they got to kind of chase them down. Uh, sometimes we'll get a couple of them, and we'll race them. And they're not very fast, but it's a uh, entertaining. <laughs> um, then we have juvenile sea robins that's showing some of the juvenile fish come through, deer in the salt meadow, uh, and uh, porgies over the uh, eelgrass beds. Um, and then there's, I mean, I could fill up multiple slides with photos like this, but here's a few just to give a little image of what's living in these um, very beautiful waters of ours. Um, we are not without issues. Um, human inter interaction, of course, we have the capacity to destroy these ecosystems and the responsibility to save them. Earth Day, that's, uh, that's what this is about, um, paying attention to our Earth. This is where we live. Uh, the main issue that um, is reaching these estuaries is the excess nitrogen pollution uh, from non-point sources. And it, we're all responsible for this. Um, septic systems, outdated septic systems, fertilizers, all these things, they get into the watershed, even if you don't live right on the water, they make themselves into the water. Um, and then just to kind of go over what this is, the nitrogen, it causes algal growth. And what happens with that algal growth is that it chokes out the sunlight and it eats up all the dissolved oxygen in the water. So there's not as much oxygen in the water for the fish and all the animals and the sunlight, it chokes it out for the grass beds, thus just really destroying uh, a lot of the ecosystem. So the health of the estuary is directly related to what we do on land. So it's important to do our part. What is our part? And that's on the next slide. So we can update our septic systems. These are, can be very costly, uh, but there are grant programs in place. Um, there are, you know, things that we are doing to progressively improve this. I think all new construction has to be up to code. And anytime you're gonna upgrade, they want you to update these septic systems to um, be more beneficial to our waters. Uh, as Sinead was talking about, plant native vegetation. Uh, native vegetation absorbs more nitrogen and it's uh, what is supposed to be here anyway to balance out our system. Should try to minimize or not use uh, fertilizers, shooting for more organic, uh, approach to gardening, landscaping, and agriculture. And then also protect our shorelines from development. So our salt marshes, they are very important to our estuaries. They are that buffer zone for both uh, storm surges, but also for watershed. They soak up a lot of these nutrients and, and can clean it. So when coastal development and destroying of salt marshes uh, is not very beneficial to our estuaries. Uh, we also can support aquaculture, as Mark was saying, Conscience Point, 
uh, Shellfish uh, Farm and Hatchery is doing great work um, growing seed uh, and, and dispersing it and, and selling it to other farmers. Uh, we should support all aquaculture. Um, oysters filter 50 gallons of water per day. So if you take like a, uh, an oyster farm that has 300,000 oysters, which is a, a mid-sized farm, that's 15 million gallons of water a day. Um, also our wild clams, mussels and scallops filter water, filter water. and um, uh, people are starting to get into sugar kelp farming and, and that's also cleaning the water. Eat more oysters. So I know it sounds crazy, but oysters cleaning it, why would we eat it? Well, eating the oysters uh, allow the farms to turn over the product. It puts money into the farm's pocket that they can thus buy more gear. And also as the oysters get larger, they're not filtering much more water. They're taking up more real estate and it just helps them to turn over the product to keep the, um, the waters cleaner. So definitely eat as many oysters. And if you don't like oysters, buy them for your friends. Um, eating oysters, eating local oysters is, is very important. And what I like to do, and my main goal in, in my business, my life, my everything, is education and stewardship through recreation. Um, sharing these experiences with children, instilling a sense of stewardship with the area. Um, when we love something and appreciate something, we take care of it. Um, ways to do this are um, you know, non-motorized boating, uh, kayaking, paddle boarding, canoeing, rowing, sailing, great ways to explore and appreciate the area. Uh, these activities bring us closer to nature and low impacts on the environment. I am for motorized boating as well, um, but this is of course the, the cleanest way. Um, fishing, hunting, and shellfish uh, harvesting. These are opportunities to get involved and get your hands dirty. Um, it does remove species, but with our size limitations and quotas, it's all manageable and sustainable. And again, any experience that you have in nature brings you closer to nature. So when you're there to make a decision, you will, you know, you, you wanna save the places that you love and recreate in. And then also birding and wildlife observing, hiking. These are all great activities to, uh, to share and to get out in nature. And then explore your shore. So this is a, a little quote. Today's children are tomorrow's decision makers. By instilling a love and appreciation for our natural world, now, as well as a holistic understanding of their roles in the, in the system, we'll have done our part to prepare them to make re, uh, responsible decisions on how to manage these areas for future generations. For my children, for your children, for their children, we have to keep these waters clean. Um, we're all part of this balance. So it's just what I believe. It's what I, I it's, it's our, it's our world. We need to save it for future generations. So thank you guys. I'm looking forward to hearing any questions and uh, happy Earth Day. So yeah, we had the first question here um, for Eric. What kind of proficiency is required for kayak group tours? Um, we do we do lessons before we go. Um, I gauge everybody. I've taken beginners, people have never been out before in their life, and I've taken professional paddlers. Uh, where we go is um, very safe waters. We um, we gauge every trip 
to our client. So we will make sure. And I also bring tow ropes if anything was to go awry. But if we ever have a situation where it's unsafe, we wouldn't go. And I make sure everybody feels comfortable before we depart on our tours. So uh, first timers are more than welcome. Let's see, uh, we have someone. Thank you to everyone. Being a Southampton resident, never even thought about it. We will definitely be in touch to explore all that is presented. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's exactly what we like to hear. Um, in the chat for everybody, I'm going to post a link to the Southampton History Museum's website for tickets for our first kayak event. Um, if you have your own vessel, you can definitely bring one. Otherwise, we do have the availability to rent them via Eric. Um, and so we're looking forward to having people join us today. So if you're interested, you can reach out to us there. Um, and we have somebody else asking, what months of the year do you operate? So uh, the kayak tours that we do together, we operate once a month in the summer here. Um, that'll be June, July, August, and September. But um, Shanae, how often are you out here in the summer doing program stuff? We'll go down the list and see what everybody does. Well, um, it really just depends. I do a lot of private different tours. Um, if you just go to the website, um, Moxkitu Consulting, there is an event page. Um, you can also subscribe because there are things that happen throughout the summer, whether they are guided walking tours for indigenous ecological perspective, um, plant knowledge, um, those type of things. So really throughout the entire summer and really into the fall up until like late November, there's a lot of um, things to do around the fall too. Uh, Mark, what's, what's going on at the Maritime Center? What's the operational status? Well, the... Uh... This is a, a, it's been a long time coming and I think most people know that town projects do take a while, but um, the, the town has engaged uh, um, an architectural firm to do the next phase of drawings necessary to get a proposal out to finish the building. And we're, we're, we're hopeful that the building is up and functioning next year. Uh, I'm not sure, it really depends. But, um, and all of our programs, our sailing school and our boat building, well, they're kind of dependent on more progress with the, the town and the building. Um, but nonetheless, we're, we're, going to, we're going to start those and we'll probably will have the sailing school running next year. And, uh, uh, but the building itself, uh, we're hopeful for next summer, but uh, it's up in the air yet. That sounds great. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll end up co-sponsoring a few more lectures and talks like this with, with Maritime Perfect. Center to uh, keep the word out. And I encourage everybody to just take a drive by and check in on the status and see how it's going. Hopefully we'll see some good progress throughout the summer. And, uh, oh, go ahead. So um, I operate uh, June 1st until the end of September, um, pretty much eight days a week. Uh, anytime uh, we're out there constantly we have a camp tour um, Monday through Friday we're going out with camps we have self-guided tours that go out uh, at the same time at various locations in North Sea and Southampton uh, we do our private tours in the afternoons uh, we do three tours a day on weekends um, you know I uh, we try to get everybody on the water and everybody to get that individual time so uh, yeah June 1st until the end of September Fantastic. Um, let's see, I don't know if I see any other questions that have come in, but um, I do want to encourage everybody that's, that watched today to, as we've already said a hundred times here, check out the various websites for each organization, um, support each one the best way you can. The best way to support everybody is to uh, participate in these uh, canoe tours and also just to get involved and educated in the local area. Um, all of our joint mission is to help preserve and promote basically the history and the ecology and the, the goodness of the area that we're in. So if you can just become connected in some way um, and help out with any organization like us or any of us, um, that would be a fantastic way to sort of help everybody all together, especially on this Earth Day, uh, thinking about collective consciousness and trying to take better care of our, our planet. And if you see any plastic or bottles on the ground today, pick them up. Um, but otherwise, um, if anybody else has anything to say, uh, before we go. No, well, thank you. Happy Earth Day. <laughs> Happy Earth Day. Perfect. All right. So we'll see you all next time and uh, have a good Earth Day.